welcome to Vista Talks, interesting discussions with interesting people from all around the world. Hello and welcome to Vista Talks, interesting discussions with interesting people from around the world. I'm your host for today, Priscilla Charles, and I'm joined in the studio by Michael Cronin. Michael is a director of the Literary and Cultural Translation Center and 1776 Chair Professor of French, a head of the French Department at Trinity College, Dublin. You're very welcome, Michael. Thank you. So let's move on and get on to the show. So Michael, could you take us through your educational and career background and um, bring us up all the way to your current position at Trinity College, please? Okay, well, I, I was born and educated here in, in Dublin and uh, then went to Trinity College uh, Dublin where I did a degree in uh, English and uh, French. Uh, I decided to, to major in, in French in, in my final year uh, because I had a kind of long-standing interest in, in French, which partly came from family background, f- partly came from personal interests. Um, my grandmother uh, taught in France during the First World War in Dijon and in, in, in Burgundy. And uh, she died when my mother was quite young, but she had passed on stories and memories to to, to my mother. So uh, I grew up in a very francophone, uh, francophile household uh, where there was a strong interest in uh, French uh, society, French uh, culture, uh, French literature. Um, And when I was uh, 16, I remember coming across in a, in a second-hand uh, bookshop uh, an anthology of French t- texts called A la manière de, which was basically uh, extracts from uh, great French writers that people would use as models uh, for writing essays in, in France. And that's when I first came across uh, Marcel Proust uh, à la recherche du temps perdu, uh, Remembers the Things Past, where he, in Du Côté de chez Swan, the Swan's Way, the first part, you know, he describes about the experience of waking up in the morning. And I remember I had an old blue and red uh, Harrop's uh, French English dictionary, and it was a concise uh, edition. So you can imagine trying to read Proust with a concise edition of the dictionary was extremely difficult. It took me weeks, I think, to get through <laughs> uh, three pages. Yes. Um, but I remember the growing sense of astonishment and wonder uh, at this uh, writer, um, at the, the, the way he sort of conceived, interpreted, uh, analyzed the world. And I was just uh, blown away uh, by this. Um, so that sort of love, if you like, continued on in when I was in Trinity College. So I decided to to, 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 to major uh, in uh, French. Uh, then I spent uh, two years in uh, France, first of all, teaching in the University of Tours, uh, the Université François uh, Rabelais. And uh, after that, I went to teach in the École Normale Supérieure in, in, in Paris, in, uh, in Cachon. Um, and these were two uh, wonderful years. Um, I didn't do very much. Uh, I remember being paid very handsomely uh, by the French government, but I hadn't a single franc left when I got back to Dublin, which meant <laughs> I, I partied hard for the two years. Uh, but that was another, if you like, introduction to uh, a, a side of French uh, life. And I developed deep affection for the uh, the Loire Valley uh, and for the city of Paris as a result mm-hmm. of those two years. So I came back to Ireland then uh, and decided for a kind of change of academic scene Uh, that I would go to uh, University uh, College Dublin, so I did a master's uh, degree there. Mm -hmm. I decided to do my um, master's work on two French writers, uh, Raymond Cuneau and Georges Perec. Mm -hmm. Uh, What really interested me was the way in which they they played around uh, with uh, language, the kind of things, the way they expanded the possibilities of French. This is something I found in in later years as a translator, um, that that immersion in very experimental, playful uh, ways of engaging with the French language was something that then was quite an acid in understanding, you know, difficult, more challenging texts in 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 in, in French. Um, so when I finished the that master's degree, um, I got a kind of a lucky break. Um, a position came up in uh, in French and translation studies at Dublin a City University. It was called the National Institute for Higher Education at the mm-hmm. time, before it became a university. Um, and I'd already, if you like, um, began to tr- translate and interpret on sort of a freelance basis in, in, in Paris when mm-hmm. I was over there. Um, and had quite a bit of experience by the time um, this position came up in, in, uh, in, DC, in DCU. Um, so I applied for the position and uh, got it. And 
Scotland, it was the first um, higher education institution on the islands to offer, and to this day the only one that offers uh, an undergraduate programme in translation studies. So I began to uh, to teach uh, on that. Um, at the same time, uh, I started doing a, a PhD, and the PhD was on uh, two uh, French Canadian writers from mm -hmm. Quebec, uh, Région du Charme and Gérard Besset. Um, and I was very, very interested in uh, what happens to the French language when it travels, it goes to a different uh, country, the kind of relationship between French and English. Because, of course, one of the things I should say when I uh, grew up in Dublin, and there were two languages in uh, at home there was Irish Gaelic that my mother spoke, and English that was spoken by my father. So I was, you know, there was that experience of the, of the bilingual of moving between languages. So uh, what interests me in the Canadian context was what happens when people move between languages. And of course, yes. this, you know, has an impact on uh, how we think about. Uh, translation. So uh, I finished uh, my PhD in Trinity in, in 1990. Wow, fascinating. So um, so you're currently now the 1776 Chair Professor of French um, and the head of the French department. So can you tell us about like when was the department created and what's the current status like and any plans you'd have for the future? Well, it was very interesting about the French department in uh, Trinity College Dublin is the chair that I occupy is the oldest chair of French in the world. Wow. Uh, the very first uh, chair in French language uh, that was created outside of France was in Ireland. Um, oh. And it's interesting that the the provost, the president of the university at the time, uh, Healy Hutchinson, um, believed in the importance of foreign uh, languages. His, mm -hmm. his sort of idea was that um, if you're going to travel uh, to different parts of, of Europe, if you're a gentleman, you're on the Grand Tour, um, that you couldn't properly engage uh, with the culture of uh, another country if you didn't speak the language uh, of the, yeah, the people. Sense. You must remember at the time, 1776, these are the glory years of, of French culture. Mm -hmm. We've got Voltaire, we've got yes. Rousseau, we've got Diderot, uh, yeah. we've got the Enlightenment, Le Siècle des Lumières. Um, so uh, French culture, uh, you know, French is the diplomatic language of Europe, mm -hmm. it's the educated language of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, so having French was considered to be uh, extremely uh, important. Um, so basically that interest in, in, in French uh, will continue uh, through the, uh, the 19th century. Um, and then it sort of begins to, to, to really expand in, in, in the 20th century century and of course uh, probably um, the most uh, famous uh, graduate of the uh, Trinity College French department is Samuel Beckett. Um, Samuel Beckett who did uh, Romance Languages, did French and Italian in, in Trinity College Dublin. He, he finished his degree, he went to the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, uh, then came back and took up a teaching position uh, in our uh, department and he taught there for about three years uh, and then to the undying uh, disappointment of his mother uh, decided to give up a good permanent pensionable job and went off to Paris uh, and the rest, of course, is, is history. Is history. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, where I see the French department as uh, developing, I'm particularly um, aware of the fact that um, as we are moving into a different uh, Europe, uh, a Europe that will no longer have um, the United Kingdom as, as, as a yes. member, mm -hmm. that it is absolutely crucial uh, for, uh, for Ireland uh, that we position ourselves in, in, in Europe. Um, and what is of ultimate strategic importance is that we are close to the, the sort of Franco-German power base in, in, in Europe and to properly uh, understand, engage with, um, assess the value of our French partners, it's absolutely crucial mm -hmm. that our students have um, as, as deep uh, and as detailed uh, and as uh, persuasive a knowledge of French language and culture as possible. So I, I very much see, um, we're, we're launching, for example, next year, a program in uh, an MPhil, a master's program in European Cultural Studies. And um, basically what we're, the reason we're setting up this program is we feel there's a lot of talk in Europe about um, the economic dimension to Europe, mm -hmm. the social dimension to Europe, uh, about uh, Europe uh, and borders, Europe migration and so on. Um, but there's very, very little talk about the cultural 
uh, dimension to Europe. And as uh, Jacques Delors uh, once famously said, you can't fall in love with the market, you know, um, or as uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, said, uh, recently the French president, and that we must uh, make Europe not so much a thought as a feeling. Mm? Uh, and of course, uh, the way you do that, the way you, 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 you engage people at a very deep level uh, with the European project uh, is through a sense of cultural identification, yes. a sense of cultural understanding, a sense of cultural uh, f uh, affiliation. So um, from that point of view then, setting up this uh, course in uh, European Cultural Studies has been very much kind of pioneered by the, the French department, is we want to have our students uh, studying all aspects of European culture, uh, literature, uh, history, um, sort of the um, political science, but also uh, one of the, the big core modules will be eating and drinking in Europe, um, where we're going to look at the different uh, food cultures across uh, Europe, you know, uh, why do the Germans have a particular affection for uh, pork? You know, what's the yes. historical origin of yes. that? Um, uh, what uh, do the French find uh, particularly interesting about geese? You know, um, if we look at, uh, at wine, particular kind of wine varieties, yeah. why are certain kind of grape varieties popular in Austria, but not so popular in France? Or are other grape varieties popular in Spain, but not so popular in Portugal? So basically, we want, um, if you like, students to uh, experience um, the kind of the, the, the complexity and diversity of uh, European cultures. And of course, uh, we would uh, argue, of course we would argue, wouldn't we, from the French department that uh, French is absolutely uh, central or core uh, to the, uh, the history, the intellectual, uh, political uh, and uh, literary history of 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 of, of Europe, mm -hmm. uh, down to uh, what people put into their uh, put in their plate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd say in the wine, yeah, it could be one of the <laughs> what you expect. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so that's that's um, that's really interesting. And um, and in this department, how many students would you have, for instance? Uh, currently, I'd say um, students. We have about two hundred and. Over the, 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 the four years, um, we, we have different programs. Um, we have the two subject model relationships, so that's people take French and history, French and, and English, French and another subject. Uh, then we have our European Studies uh, program, where students take uh, two languages and they take uh, politics and uh, history. Then we have a, a computer science, linguistics and uh, French. Uh, degree, and uh, then we have students who are in business who, who are taking French. So I'd say if we take the the the, 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 the broad uh, picture of the students, we, we have about over the four years about seven hundred students. Seven hundred uh, yeah, students. Taking, wow, taking, that's taking, brilliant. Taking French, you know, yeah. different. Now some of those uh, will be more. I, I say the students who are kind of core specialists in French. Uh, is, the figure would be around about two forty to 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 to, to three hundred. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And uh, so I suppose with this uh, master's degree uh, launching next year, it, it's going to develop, it's going to expand. Uh, absolutely. The, yeah. the, the idea is that we want to, uh, you know, a, a expand the presence of, 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 of French in, in coordination with, 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 with other languages. I mean, I, I would have to say that from where I stand uh, at third level, um, I, I'm quite concerned about the position of languages at primary level in, mm -hmm. in, in Ireland. It was a very good initiative, um, the uh, Foreign Languages and Primary Schools uh, initiative, which was um, discontinued uh, during the, the austerity years. It mm -hmm. wasn't a very expensive programme, it only cost about 5 million uh, euro, but it was very good uh, to get children introduced to language at an early age, yeah. because as we all know, um, the, the earlier you learn languages, the better. It it's much, much easier if you yeah, learn. Your, bra if your brain is kind of a sponge, yeah. yeah. The, the brain is a yeah. sponge in terms of your kind of phonetic repertoire. Mm -hmm. You find it much easier to acquire a foreign accent. Um, so there's a kind of flexibility. As the French say, there's a disponibilité, kind of an availability at that mm -hmm. age yes. um, that you uh, find uh, more problematic uh, later in life because we've much stronger kind of ego self-image. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the place to start. So, I mean, I would have to say one of the things that I, I'm sort of would be keen to kind of promote um, as Professor French in, in Trinity College Dublin is a, a more holistic approach to language learning generally mm -hmm. uh, throughout the country. And this not just for French, but for you know German, Italian, Chinese, yeah. um, Polish, you know whatever you know uh, the the other modern languages happen to be. 
Absolutely, yeah. And um, and so we, we discussed how you, you also taught in other universities. So you taught in uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure in Cachan and uh, in DCU, but also in Belgium, in Peru, Egypt, Canada. So have you noticed any differences in the approach of teaching and, uh, and learning translation in other languages, in other countries? Yeah, I think what you did, it's basically kind of two ways or two approaches to uh, teaching uh, translation. And one is an approach that's clearly linked to a kind of a language learning mm -hmm. approach. In other words, and this is what I found was the case largely in Peru, um, parts of Spain, uh, some of the uh, French Uh, universities was basically they were teaching you translation as a way of improving uh, your knowledge of English okay. um, and so it was very much part of a kind of language uh, pedagogy um, the approach that I find for example in countries but uh, see in, in, in Ireland but um, in a country like um, Belgium, for example, mm -hmm. uh, in Finland, um, I would have to say uh, also my, my experience of teaching in, 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 in Egypt uh, and in Canada is that they are uh, much more concerned with teaching translations of professional practice. In other words, they're concerned with um, what kinds of things does a translator uh, need? Yeah. Um, what uh, so they're 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 they take for granted, if you like, that you know the source language. Mm -hmm. So really what they're trying to do is to make you an effective Uh, user of your target language, that the real emphasis is on producing uh, texts and translations um, that make sense, that are readable, that are acceptable to, 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 to target audiences. Um, so the, having to think about who your customers are, yep. who your readers are, who's paying uh, for the translator, how do you deal with deadlines, how do you deal with pressure, um, how do you deal um, with, um, with workflows, work organization, um, how do you interface, how do you interact with uh, new technologies and uh, what are the kinds of uh, lexical uh, sort of uh, resource, dictionary resources that you need, what kinds of access do you need to parallel uh, texts and so So all of these things which are part of the kind of the, the everyday experience of, of, of a translator. I find that in countries like Canada, Belgium and I think many Irish institutions, they're, they're, uh, they're, there's more of an emphasis uh, on that. So it's really, I, sus I think that the fundamental difference is um, the difference between a pedagogical orientation to translation and a professional yes. orientation to translation. Yeah, and that has been the sort of the, 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 the major uh, difference. I suppose um, another difference that I've noted is the countries where you have the presence Uh, of another language. Mm -hmm. This would be the case in Belgium. Yes. This is the case in Peru with the uh, indigenous languages. Uh, the case um, when I've taught in in uh, Catalonia, uh, yeah. Catalonia in, in, in Spain, is that people are much more sensitive and aware uh, of translation issues. Um, it's rather like here in Dublin, even if you don't speak uh, Irish, don't speak Irish Gaelic, you're aware of uh, Irish Gaelic ar around you and, and signs and when you're taking the tram, when you're on the bus and so on. So, mm -hmm. so whereas I find countries um, like the United Kingdom, uh, the United States, uh, France, Um, where um, certainly in the in the, the, the public domain there isn't much exposure to language difference. Yes. Um, you don't see much in terms of bilingual signage. Uh, of course, you're going to hear foreign languages in Marseille, in Paris, yeah. uh, in Lille, um, just as you will in New York. And but it, it's, uh, it's not know, the same. Yeah. It's not the same. There isn't that, that sense of. So I, I think that does produce a different kind of mindset. It's a, maybe a greater openness to the practice and the profession and the meaning and the consequences and the effects of, of translation in people's lives. Yeah, absolutely, because as you uh, mentioned, the example of Belgium where both of the languages would be present, or Catalonia, for instance, most of the time, even uh, in Corsica, Corsica, although Corsican wouldn't be spoken, you'd still see um, signs uh, with, the, with French and Corsican. So that's definitely, yeah, um, awareness-wise, yes. 
Um, and um, so can you tell us a bit about your current research? Um, so I'm, I understand you work on eco-criticism in relation to modern languages and translation. And I'd like to explore a bit the notion of translation trauma uh, in relation to population displacement and, uh, and investigating language identities as mediated through travel. So a bit of... Can you expand a bit on translation trauma? Yeah, um, this basically, I, I started reading um, a, uh, some work um, on uh, the, what happened to um, Armenians who had uh, survived the sort of the mass slaughter in, in, in 1915. Um, and, um, uh, and a number of these um, made their way to France. Probably the most famous yeah. um, is Charles Aznavour, an old singer, yes. um, who was part of that kind of Armenian uh, diaspora. Mm -hmm. And a very interesting uh, thinker and writer called uh, Janine uh, Altunia um, wrote uh, a book, um, La Cure de l'Écriture, um, looking at what was the, the sort of the linguistic consequences of this. So we had people who, who survived um, this terrible uh, event yes. and who come to, to, to France. They had uh, acquired uh, the French language. They sort of translated themselves into the French language. Um, and then their children uh, grew up in, in, in France, yeah. speaking French, uh, with no, or little or no access to uh, Armenian. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there is this kind of transgenerational trauma, so the, the, the trauma of the genocide in, 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 in 1915, um, which couldn't really be articulated. In other words, um, her uh, father uh, was, uh, had suffered, you know, mm -hmm. um, and had, had written uh, about this, had written about it yeah. in uh, Armenian. Um, but the problem then was kind of to translate this into French. So um, she then set about um, learning uh, Armenian, uh, and translated his account uh, of the terrible events that happened to him and his family in, in that period. Um, and so she began to think then about the whole question of, of translation trauma, of, of you know, how the trauma of translating yourself into a different language, a different uh, culture. Uh, and then the, tr the, the, the how do you translate very traumatic material uh, Actually, into? Yeah. And how do you deal then with the, the grandchildren, the great grandchildren who are, are, are unconsciously carrying that trauma with them in that kind of transgenerational trauma, mm -hmm. but have no access to the original site of trauma yeah. that was in a in different language, a different country, a different uh, Time, culture. Yeah. So I began to think about this in terms of the Irish famine because um, and the, 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 the question around um, the revival of Irish, the use of, of Irish, which is um, a very difficult issue for many uh, Irish uh, people. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very frequent source of debates and arguments of parties, people saying, well, reviving Irish is a complete waste of time, this language is useless, what can you mm -hmm. do with it? We should all speak English and, 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 and so on. Um, and often a very emotional reaction to this question. Um, so I began to wonder, um, why so much anger? Uh, why so much because this language poses no threat <laughs> to, to, to anyone. Yeah. Uh, so why is there so much kind of emotional anger, so much emotional kind of disturbance uh, ar around this? Um, and I began to uh, look at w when is the, the big shift? When is the decisive shift in terms of, um, you know, so Ireland at the beginning of the 19th century is mm -hmm. predominantly an Irish speaking country. And at the end of the century, 2% uh, of speakers are speaking uh, Irish. So there's an absolute dramatic uh, shift yeah uh, but of course what happens um, in the the famine period um, you know beginning with the famine and deaths and then going on to to, to, to migration is that uh, half of the population um, basically vanished two million through uh, famine illness and death and yeah. two million uh, through uh, immigration yes the vast majority of those people are uh, Irish speakers. Um, so what you have then is a traumatic language shift with a very traumatic event. If you think about it, what do you do with your mouth? Two things to do with it. You speak with your mouth and you eat with your mouth. Yeah. Um, so the site of trauma is the mouth, is the speaking uh, organ. Um, and what, what, I, what, what kind of interests me is um, 
how when a country translates itself from one language to another, as mm -hmm. the Irish have done, mm -hmm. as, 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 as many people are doing migrating when they, 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 they go from one language to, to another, yeah. sometimes in happy circumstances, sometimes in very, very traumatic circumstances, uh, what happens in that translation moment? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so translation, a translation trauma project is basically looking at instances of traumatic uh, historical changes in different parts of the world and looking at the translation dimension uh, to that. Wow, fascinating. And um, and to to move on to a different topic, you are um, you're an honorary member of the Irish Translators and uh, Interpreters uh, Association. So could you tell us what, what you've observed, if you've observed um, anything in the way that translation is done nowadays compared to when you started in the field of linguistics, really? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, I was a uh, founding member of the Irish Translators Association, it was then called in, in 1986. Uh, and I remember we organised a seminar that was attended by lots of people in 1987 on uh, how to use a fax card. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I think the biggest change that I've observed uh, over that period, you know, 86 to, 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 to now, um, so over more than 30 years in the translation profession, um, is, um, I suppose, one is local and the, the other is universal. The local change is just the huge expansion in the number of uh, and diversity of uh, translators that are here in, in, in Ireland. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, we were a very small group of people uh, yeah. back in 86. Um, German and French uh, and Irish were basically the three languages that we were uh, working with. Um, but with the exponential growth, the 160 plus languages in the city of Dublin now, um, the exponential growth in the number and variety of, of languages, uh, the way in which technology has connected yeah, the absolutely. Irish translation profession to the world, that huge growth in software localization uh, throughout the 1990s, um, that this has made for, at, at a local level, you know, an extremely varied and complex translation landscape. I think you know, universally, um, it, it, without question, it has been the impact uh, of, of technology. And uh, I suppose for, for me, it's the, it's the role of the translator in, in that technology. I think all translators now are cyborgs. You know, I think we're part machine, part, part human. <laughs> we, we're kind of part of that kind of cyborg uh, loop. Um, and the question, and particularly as expert systems become yeah. more and more sophisticated, Absolutely. artificial intelligence, yes. how this moves into machine translation and so on, statistical machine translation um, and neural mach machine translation. Yeah. As these become more and more complex, it's what is going to be the role of of, of translators uh, in the, uh, the the future? Because mm -hmm. it's certainly creating, I think, a very very fast changing work environment for translators. Um, uh, extraordinary kind of time pressures because people have expectations in terms of what translations can deliver. They can deliver as fast as, as the machines and and, and so on. Um, the question of of quality. Um, how this is affected by these these changes. So these are all kind of big issues for, for translators. But I often wonder whether going into the future that we might see a time when basically we will be training uh, translators not so much to produce translations as to receive them. What I mean by that is that m much of the translation work could become uh, automated to a very great uh, d degree. Yeah. But what translators will, will do is they will look at what are the potential benefits to the society of using this kind of translation, uh, of translating in this area rather than in that area? Uh, uh, what kind of translations do uh, we need uh, for the medical service? What kind of translations do we need for the legal profession? So in Absolutely, other words, yeah. they'd be almost like people would be kind of curating uh, translations for uh, social uses. So I think that the, the nature uh, of what it is translators uh, will do uh, will, will shift. And this has implications, of course, of for how we train translators, yeah. we made to be more aware of the kind of social uh, impacts, uh, social and cultural impacts of translation, rather than focusing obsessively, like on the translation process itself. Wow, and um, and um, you also serve as a you served sorry as a literature uh, advisor for the Arts Council of Ireland, and you're the former chairperson of Poetry Ireland. So. 
And now you're currently part of the group working on the Culture 2025 National Policy Committee. I'd like you to, to tell me a bit about the committee. Um, what does it aim at? Yeah, basically the idea of the, uh, the, the committee is that it, for the first time ever, um, the government is committed to drawing up a cultural policy for, for Ireland. It's kind of, kind of ironic, uh, a country that's so well known you know, worldwide for its literature, for its Nobel Prize winners, for its music, uh, its dance and so on, has never had a cultural policy. Um, so basically what we're trying to do is to see uh, how we can make uh, Cultural, culture, a kind of an everyday reality for people, not just kind of a high level elite culture, but how do we bring culture into the schools? How do we bring culture into the home? How do we bring culture into the workplace? Um, uh, how do we uh, increase um, the amount of money that we invest? Um, because if we look at, you know, uh, different areas in Ireland, if we look at agriculture, uh, education, and so yeah. on, uh, the cultural budget is really quite small. Um, so, but there's no point in increasing a budget if, if you don't uh, spend that money intelligently. Um, so the uh, idea then is to try and um, make people um, aware of the, the potential of culture, the potential of culture, the economic potential uh, of culture, because so many of the creative industries draw on, on, on cultural depth. Um, the social importance of culture, how we can use culture to build communities and create a sense of solidarity in a mm -hmm. world of kind of iPhone fragmentation, yes. uh, where people are often their little kind of cyber uh, yeah, silos. Stuck on their phone, yeah. um, and uh, also, I think what I might call the kind of the psychosocial uh, dimension to culture, how culture contributes to a sense of well-being, a sense of, of, of happiness, uh, a sense of kind of internal uh, richness or wealth that you get from the experience of art, the, the experience of music, uh, the experience of literature, uh, the experience of, of dance. So looking at kind of culture in its multiplicity, mm -hmm. the way in which it can contribute to very many and important uh, public and social uh, goods um, so that Ireland becomes uh, a good place uh, to live and uh, to work in uh, and to be part of a, a, a larger community. Wonderful. And a very last question. Uh, what would be your advice to anyone interested in, uh, in linguistics and uh, as, study, as a study and also as a professional field? Uh, I think the most important thing, uh, if you're interested in language, is get yourself to the country. Uh, it doesn't matter what you do, uh, wash dishes, uh, polish shoes, uh, you know, scrub windows, uh, but get yourself over to the, uh, the country, because when you get to the country, you realize, wow, uh, one so this, this is so <laughs> different. It is so interesting. It's so unlike what I, um, and um, that will make you curious. Um, and I think that the really the most important thing of all, and this applies to any profession, and but it's it, but applies above all to language, is being curious, being curious about people, being curious about culture, being curious about food, uh, being curious about drink, uh, whatever it is that that, that kind yeah. of floats your boat. Um, but uh, curiosity is is at the heart of the matter. So that I really would um, strongly advise a person is uh, get over there, uh, be there, uh, experience the, the, the culture uh, and then offer yourself the greatest gift, the gift that will last you an entire lifetime, which is the gift of language, which is then going to be the key to knowing the people, knowing their music, knowing their food, knowing their culture, knowing their history, uh, visiting uh, their land uh, and uh, so that you will be living not just one life, but two and learn more languages than <laughs> three, four, five lines. <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, thanks very much, Michael. That was fascinating. Um, and it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here today. So um, thanks for spending time with us today and uh, and sharing the great work that you do at Trinity College. Um, that's the end of today's show uh, with Michael Cranning from Trinity College Dublin. So please tune in again to see the next Vista Talk show where we'll be discussing more interesting discussions with interesting people from around the world. <laughs>